why you are looking at the draft promo and NFL Rivals all wrong. What is up, NFL Rivals enthusiasts? My name is Too Natural. I'm the best source for all your Rivals news, pack openings, gameplay, competitive gameplay, all that stuff. So the draft promo is the first content we've gotten in NFL Rivals on the main worldwide launch, and it's been really exciting so far. I think it may be the most significant promo of the first year, and in this video, I'm going to tell you why it's so important and why I think most of the community is approaching it all wrong. This is going to be episode one of my NFL Rivals Nomics series, where I try to break down the market and the economy of this NFL Rivals game. Um, my inspirations are like Brody does Mad Mobile, Gut Fox. They did a great job of these on Mad Mobile and Mutt, um, respect, respectively, right? Uh, I just want to give a quick disclaimer. None of the stuff I say in these videos is financial advice. Please do not invest because of me. And I'm really treating this more from like a Madden point of view where I want us to like make myth and improve our teams. Uh, I don't really want to be speculating on how to make real life money, I guess. I want to kind of keep it game based. If you guys can make money, that's cool. But please don't invest a lot of money based on what I say in these videos. Um, this is just meant to be like cool, just like to analyze the market not like super serious, like dump thousands in there. You know what I mean? Because you, you never know. We've seen in this last couple weeks with the myth token, it's been up and down. Even if you make all the right decisions, you never know what's going to happen. So please only put into this game what you can afford to put in and what you would still enjoy playing with those cards, even if their real life value goes to zero, right? All right, with that out of the way, let's get right into it. All right. So first off, let's do an overview of the NFL Draft promo if you guys are still unfamiliar with it. So the Draft promo right now contains all the first round picks from this year's 2023 NFL Draft. So the cards are broken down into tiers based on how high they're selected with picks 1 through 8 being legendary, 9 through 19 being epic, and 20 to 31 being rare. So the Draft promo also contains past Draft Legends as drops from events and collections, but that's not particularly relevant to what we're going over today. Uh, so the draft is really only the first round rookies from this year. Uh, I don't know if they have plans to expand it, but at this point, it doesn't seem like it. So why do I think the draft promo is so significant? And what's a mistake a lot of people, in my opinion, are making? So the reason I think this promo is so significant and why I said it's a first it's the most important of this year. Um, and that's not hyperbole. I truly believe that. Because in my eyes, with the rookie upgrade system, uh, the NFL Rivals team has really set the tone or the uh, power the power creep curve for the game. I believe it sets the tone for expected progression. So from what the NFL team has talked about in the Discord and on spaces, from what I've heard other community members say, they do want to keep the amount of player cards limited. So one player will only get like one or two cards per like real NFL season. This is different from like Madden and other franchises where really good players or really popular players will get four or five different cards that are better and better. So I think um, we can, the team wants these draft cards to still be relevant, right? It makes no sense for them to be uh, the most exciting youngest rookies, youngest stars in the NFL. Um, and then they just have like a trash card in NFL rivals, right? So they already thought of this, and this is why we have the rookie upgrade system, where rookies will upgrade power or overall or whatever based on in-season milestones that they hit. So if they perform better in real life, uh, they'll perform better in the game, have better stats, kind of like fantasy football. It's pretty fun. Great idea, in my opinion. So what I think is that how these cards will set the curve. I expect rare cards to still be like budget or squad builder players. Like they're going to be relevant and they're going to be nice cards for good teams. The average rare, I think they want to be like a cheap card that beginners can pick up as like one of their first NFTs and like have fun playing with. Um, epics, I think will probably be good tier cards. Not as good as they are right now, but like B tier cards, like good in the meta. Like competitive teams will still maybe have a couple epics. But like the top spenders, the top whales, the most competitive players are going to have the legendary cards. I think the team wants legendaries to still be amazing top position options. About A tier and then the mythicals are going to be S tier obviously because they're super rare, super valuable. Um, so I think we can predict the future overall curve based on the rookie upgrades a lot better than you guys might think. And I've actually done a lot of research, a lot of numbers in this video. 
So the position I used um, to show how the rookie upgrades work and to show how what we can expect from the team later in the year is offensive tackle. So why did I use offensive tackle? Is because in this NFL draft, there's an offensive tackle of each rarity tier. So we have Paris Johnson Jr. in the legendary tier. Um, we have three offensive linemen, Broderick Jones, uh, Peter Scoronzi, and Darnell Wright in the epic tier. And then we have Anton Harrison from the Jaguars in the rare tier. So we also have nine first round offensive tackles, not even just offensive linemen, offensive tackles specifically uh, as rookies from the 2021 and 2022 draft. So we're going to break down how those last ones performed and how that would convert into power in this year's game and try to calculate what an average offensive lineman will look like when we get to like February at the end of the year after the awards are given out and these rookie cards power is finalized, right? And just as a reminder, uh, these are updated every week. So the milestone is the first five games, these offensive linemen. So we can expect, we can basically see the power curve for the whole year based on when these cards are going to get upgraded, when it's likely for them to do it. I just did it for a whole season, but you guys could go deeper in the numbers if you wanted to. So the general upgrades for rookies are to start your first game, to start more than nine games, uh, to win a rookie of the week award, or to make the all rookie team. So uh, to start the first game, seven of nine offensive tackles drafted in the last two years in the first round uh, started their first game. So the other two were Trevor Penning and Christian Derisaw, and both of them were injured. So I'm going to assume this is almost a guarantee as long as the offensive lineman is healthy, and we're going to give them the full plus five power upgrade for that. Uh the other milestone is starting more than nine games, which actually more of the rookies hit. Eight of the nine hit. So Christian Derisaw, he actually got healthy and he played in like more games that year than the nine game requirement. And Trevor Penning, unfortunately, was still hurt and struggled to make his way back into the Saints line rotation. But we're just going to assume that's 100% because it's even better than the last one unless you get hurt or something really bad happens. You would have to be really bad as an offensive lineman. Um, I want to know Alex Leatherwood is in the sample size. He did start more than nine games. And if you're a football fan, you know, Alex Leatherwood is one of the most terrible offensive linemen in the league right now, but we're going to assume plus 10 power from that one. Unfortunately, the Pepsi rookie of the week award offensive linemen aren't sexy. They're not going to get that award. So we're just going to give them zero points for that. Let me just grab some water. I'm talking a lot. You need to stay hydrated. So, and then the all rookie team. So in the last two years, there's two tackle positions for the all rookie team. So three first round selections took out of the four, two for each year. Um, Cause there was a fifth round rookie, I believe last year that made the all rookie team. So three of the nine, three of the nine offensive linemen. So we're going to assume a third, there's a third chance. You have a one in three chance if you're a first round offensive lineman to make the all rookie team. Uh, so we're gonna need a plus five power for that uh, because the all rookie team gives 15. So we'll just give a third of that. So now we'll move on to the offensive line specific upgrades. Uh, if you play over 250 plays in your first five games, uh, seven out of nine offensive linemen drafted in the first round in the last two years hit that. I'm not sure if, Special team snaps count as plays. If they do, then eight out of nine hit that. So we're just going to assume that's, again, another guaranteed plus five power unless the guy unfortunately gets hurt, which obviously we hope they don't. The next one is 350 plays in the first five games. So this one was hit by two of nine, Panay Sewell and another lineman. I forgot his name, but both of them played on. Oh, it was Rashawn Slater. Panay Sewell and Rashawn Slater. So both of those guys played on the Chargers and the Lions, which, as we know, are really high-volume passing offensive that are going to run up-tempo. It's really based on the offense and not really the linemen's individual performance, how many plays they run. But I would say, uh, because 2 of 9 hit, we'll give it one-fifth chance of happening. So we'll give that plus 2 power out of the possible 10, just on average. And then the third offensive line-specific one is blocking for a thousand yard rusher and you have to play a minimum of 500 snaps to get this bonus so four out of nine of the offensive linemen in their first year 
hit this one. So we're going to give it about a half chance. I feel pretty good about the offensive linemen this year, their chance to hit it. Uh, they all have pretty decent running backs, I think. Um, so if we look at Paris Johnson on the Cardinals, you have James Conner. Uh, he's pretty iffy to hit 1,000, but he is a pretty decent running back. Um, we look at Chicago with Darnell Wright. You have a new running back, Roshan Johnson. Uh, the worry there is a committee, obviously, but I think Roshan has a decent chance to emerge. It's still iffy, but you have talent for sure in that backfield. And then Skaronski landed in an awesome spot. You have Derrick Henry. If Derrick Henry's healthy the whole year, that's a guaranteed power for you. Derrick Henry's hitting 1,000 yards. And then uh, Broderick Jones has Najee Harris, who after last year, I think he's a little uh, underrated, actually. And I think Najee has a good chance on an improved Sewers offense. Hopefully, Broderick Jones is part of that improvement. And I think he should hit 1,000 yards. And then finally, Anton Harrison. Uh, Etienne is a great young back. If he stays healthy, I think he has a great shot to hit 1,000 yards on that loaded offense. But, okay, so, like I said, shockingly, even Alex Leatherwood, a terrible offensive tackle, would have been upgraded 20 power with these milestones, and he very easily cleared the game started, and the 250 snaps, he was actually really close to hitting the 350 snaps. If we had in special teams, he would have landed at 341 in his first five weeks. So, we can assume, based on our averages, five power from uh, starting your first game, 10 power from starting more than nine games, uh, one third chance to make the all rookie team. So five out of a possible 15 power uh, over 250 plays in your first five games, another five power. And then 350 plays was a small chance. We only like average out the chance. So that's only two power. And then you have about a half chance, 50, 50 chance to block for a thousand yard rusher while playing 500 snaps. So we'll give plus five power out of 10 there. Like I said, or I haven't said this, but it's not really like an average in real life, obviously. You either get 10 or 0. I'm just trying to give you like an average. So then we can assume a base unupgraded offensive tackle at the end of the season will be about boosted about 32 power. So right now, uh, Anton Harrison is 96 power. He would get boosted to 128. Um, and then the epics would be around the 142 to 148 range. And then a legendary tackle... Paris Johnson right now is 120 power, unupgraded, level one. And then if he would be boosted 32 power, he'd about be about 152 power. So what we can see now is that we can expect that to be about the range to be like competitive, uh, budget, super competitive. So having about like 128, 130 overall is still going to be like a budget-ish squad. Uh 145 ish range mid 140s is probably going to be um a decent squad like a good squad a competitive squad and then over 150 is going to be like an elite squad like a top tier squad competing in like the top 20 for the camara right now for example of course uh they could just throw all this out the window this is just my theory on how this like upgrades shows us based on what we can expect from the past we can a little bit see how much we think these guys are going to get boosted and what the overall for each position. You can go through this for each position. I just felt like offensive tackle was really easy for me to calculate based on the past. So, yeah. So, I realize I haven't talked about the big mistake. I did talk about why people are underestimating the significance. But the big mistake people are making, write this down, is people are buying for the current power of the player not the future potential power. So like I said, with the offensive tackles, we can predict the future curve based on rookie upgrades, but not all rookies are the same, especially at skilled positions. Um, in addition to looking at past things, we can actually use player futures and odds, as well as fantasy football to target rookies who we think will perform well. So for this one, obviously wide receivers are big in fantasy football. So we're gonna break this down so let's look at the wide receivers so let's look at underdog fantasy if you guys aren't super familiar with fantasy football we're looking at redraft fantasy so whoever scores the most fantasy points is probably going to get a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns and also have a good chance to win those rookie of the week all rookie teams um so on underdog actually right now as of today when i'm recording this video the number one rookie wide receiver on underdog adp wise 
is Jackson Smith and Jingba. He's going at about the 57.1 pick. Uh, Jordan Addison is next at 71.3. Quentin Johnston is going uh, 86.6. And then Zay Flowers is actually going last out of the rookie wide receivers, 90.4. Now, when we look at their situations, it makes a lot of sense for offensive production. Um, Zay Flowers is stuck in Baltimore, which is a run-heavy scheme with Lamar Jackson. They've never really thrown the ball that much to their wide receiver one. Um, even though Flowers is a talented player, it's very likely that the offensive scheme is not going to favor him. So, yeah. Quentin Johnston is a talented wide receiver with a great QB in a great offensive scheme. But the problem is he has two established wide receivers, Keenan Allen and uh, Mike Williams going ahead of him on the depth chart that are going to take a lot of targets, receptions, yards, touchdowns, stuff like that. That's going to kind of minimize his chances to be a big star, at least right away. Um, and next is Jordan Addison. Now, I actually like Jordan Addison better than Jackson Smith and Jigba. And a um, statistic we're going to pull up later actually does favor Addison. But I who am I to argue with underdog, right? Uh, this is real money draft, so this is ADPs where people are really putting money down. So I trust the people with money on the line more than me with no money on the line right now, uh, just making predictions. But I do like Addison. He's on the Vikings, a very pass-heavy team. He does have to compete with, um, who is it, uh, Justin Jefferson, obviously, and then TJ Hawkinson for targets. But you guys can just look at Adam Thielen's production last year in that wide receiver two role over there. Uh, absolute beast. Uh, Addison is a very productive college wide receiver. I think he'll do great. And um, there's enough targets to go around and having such good players on offense might actually pull volume away because he's still in that role. And they're actually more pass heavy and a better offense, in my opinion, than the Chargers. Um, Jackson Smith and Jigba, I'm really not sure why he's ahead of Addison because like Johnston, uh, he does have two super good wide receivers ahead of him on the depth chart with Metcalf and Lockett. And the QB there is actually not as good with Geno Smith. Regardless, he's the first wide receiver. I don't remember he's the first wide receiver off the board, actually. I might bite my words on that. Um, let me check that real quick. Uh, yeah, and Jigba is actually the first wide receiver off the board out of those four, which got taken four in a row. So that does tell us a little something that he's a team decided to pick him over the other wide receivers when all of them were still available. And also, it's still a great offense. Don't get me wrong. Um, you can look at Metcalf and Lockett. They've both been putting up productive seasons most of their career. Uh, so then, yeah, that's about a little bit about their situations. If you're not super big into fantasy, if you're not following stuff like that. Another resource we can use to predict these, uh, how much a player is going to get upgraded in NFL Rivals and how much they're going to produce in the season, which hopefully correlates to power upgrades, is their player props, their futures, how much people are betting on that they'll catch in yards this season. So they're actually on price picks. They're backing me up. They think Jordan Addison is going to do better. The line is over under 825.5. I think price picks lines are pretty reliable because you have to pick over under. So they want the line to be as close to 50-50 as possible. So they make the most money possible on that house edge. Uh, Addison is followed right behind uh, 25, 26 yards by Njigba, who his over under is 799.5. So you can expect about 800 receiving yards for Njigba. Um, Quentin Johnson, big drop from JSN to Quentin Johnston. Uh, Johnson is at 650.5. Um and then Flowers is another 25 yards behind that uh, at 625.5. Um, so according to these uh, according to these metrics, right, they think that Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be um, the first or second, him or Jordan Addison are going to be the first or second most productive wide receiver this season, right? And if we move that over to NFL Rivals line of thinking, they should be the most valuable because they're going to get the most power upgrades. At least they have the highest chance to, right? Followed by Quentin Johnston. And then last would be Zay Flowers stuck on that run-heavy Baltimore offense. But when we look when we look at the marketplace, it's actually not reflecting this. So 
Quentin Johnston is actually the cheapest wide receiver, which makes sense because he's the second lowest in our rankings, right? Um, he's at about 325 right now, uh, just when this video is being recorded. And then JSN and Addison are at 450 each. They're both priced the same. And then Zay Flowers, there was a huge run on Zay Flowers today, actually. I was shocked. I think someone pumped the card or grabbed a bunch of supply. Uh, but Zay Flowers is at almost $20 at 1950 Despite the production telling us that he's probably going to get upgraded in the lease this season. Um, so Zay Flowers, and there's other reasons for this. I mean, Zay Flowers is going to be in my Budget Beast video coming up. Maybe not if he keeps going up like this. But he has insane stats. He has way better speed acceleration than the other wide receivers. But the thing is, does it really matter that much if you have good speed right now when the other guy is going to be plus, maybe like plus 10, plus 20 on you. He's going to be like 110, 115 instead of your like 100, 105 power at the end of the season, right? So I think there's a real argument to be made that Jason and Addison shouldn't be valued below Zay Flowers or they shouldn't be valued that low at least because they're much more likely to get upgraded in the future. They have more future value. Now, obviously, people want Zay to help their team now. That's a factor. I'm not denying that. But if you're talking about, like, what is the best place that you want a receiver that maybe can stay relevant throughout the season, you might not want to be putting your money in Zay Flowers, and you might be want to go in with a more long-term option. Now, let's talk about the risks behind this, because there's a good chance that I'm wrong about this. Um, the first risk, obviously, like I talked about earlier, is that power creep is more than expected. So there's a good chance that the overall curve actually goes up uh, more than we expect. So the end of the season for offensive tackles, let's say, is 170 instead of 150. And by the end, of, by the time the upgrades come around, all your cards are just irrelevant, right? And the second one is kind of plays into that. It's a very long time before the season even begins. And these guys are even eligible for upgrade. Uh, it's until September. So we're in May right now. You have June, July, August, and then mid-September the season is right. So that's four months where you don't know what kind of content is going to come out. You're holding your myth in there. Um, like I said, I don't want to go too much into coin, but we saw the myth price drop below $1, um, lose a lot of its value and there's a chance that either the mythos price tanks um or the perceived value of the game overall drops like it hopefully doesn't lose player base but we have to admit that that's a possibility uh like i said i don't want to go too much into IRL money so i don't want to dive into those or expound on those too much i'm sure you guys will know what i mean though um and there's pretty big risks because like i said it's like three four months until the season starts but I just wanted to give you guys a different perspective on the draft promo. If you guys don't choose to value your wide receivers differently, I think at least we can all start thinking about the how the draft promo sets a precedent for the future power curve of the game. That has been Rivalsnomics number one. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you watched all 25 minutes of me just rambling and you enjoyed it, comment down below. Let me know if I should make more videos like this. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and have a great day.